All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is my first time doing one of these silent discos, so just to make sure everybody can hear me, if you can hear me, can I just get a quick thumbs up? Awesome. Great. Uh, so, welcome to Securing the Edge with AWS IoT Services. My name is Scott Allison. I am a Senior Technical Product Manager in charge of AWS IoT Greengrass, um, and I'm co-presenting today with Neil Mitra. He's a Senior Solutions Architect uh, specific to IoT. All right, let's jump right into it. So the agenda, what are we gonna be talking about today? Um, we're gonna start with a brief overview of IoT and why security for devices at the edge is so important. Um, we're gonna quickly talk about the AWS shared responsibility model for security. We're gonna dive deeper into AWS IoT Greengrass, Amazon Free RTOS, and the security features that they offer. Uh, and then once we finish with the talk, uh, we've got a little demo that Neil's gonna run um, that will demonstrate the end-to-end -end configura configuration experience um, using Greengrass. All right, so let's start. IoT. So if you're here, you already know how important IoT is and will be. Um, it's been adopted across a lot of different verticals, the connected home, um, industrial environments, agricultural environments, and even financial services. Um, you've probably got some smart devices in your home. Um, you've got some televisions or light bulbs, um, thermostat, maybe even a couple of Alexa devices. Um, and then IDT is predicting that worldwide technology spending on IoT is going to increase to over a trillion dollars by 2022. So it's a big market. Um, and the connected society is making our lives better in a lot of ways. I mean, you probably have a Ring net or Nest Cam at home that you use for monitoring or for your doorbell. Um, it's pervasive and it's going to be everywhere. But along with that, there are some challenges. So you've probably read about some of these security issues with IoT devices in the news. Um, you've probably received spam emails that may have been generated by a botnet run on IoT devices. You've probably heard about the ability to hack cars that run IoT. Um, you probably heard a lot about botnets like Mirai, right? I mean, it was a pretty simple botnet. It uses Telnet and a list of default passwords to compromise IoT devices and created a denial of service attack that disrupted internet traffic on the East Coast for months. Right, And then you can use devices for other things like crypto mining if they're maliciously uh, compromised. And then in 2017, there was an FDA warning about cardiac devices that could be hacked. So these are all really scary things that you don't want to happen to your IoT devices. Right, and it doesn't stop there. I mean, there's a laundry list of things you could use IoT devices for because they're general purpose computing devices. Denial of service we talked about. There's lateral threat escalation where someone can compromise your network using an IoT device and get in to perform other malicious activity. Information theft, if you've got personally identifiable information or other valuable data they could steal. Surveillance, you obviously don't want someone breaking into your camera and using that to watch you while you sleep. That's weird. Um, sabotage, cryptocurrency, ransomware, um, malicious access. And then another important piece is cloud infrastructure abuse. Because IoT devices tend to pass data back up into the cloud, that access to those cloud uh, resources can cost you money if they're used by a malicious actor, and you want to prevent that as well. And so along with all those potential, uh, potential avenues of abuse, You've also got IoT solutions that are very complex and multidimensional, and lots of pieces. You build an application and it can comprise a lot of things. You've got an edge layer that has devices and sensors where you onboard, operate, and manage your devices. You've got a communication layer that handles that communication from the edge back to the cloud that needs to be secured with TLS or encryption. Um, and then you need you know, an ingestion and analytics layer where you can build applications that report on the data that you're collecting from your devices so that you can use it internally. Um, and then you've got applications and services. You've got user applications that your end users would use based on the data that you've collected. And then you've got management applications that you use internally for deployment, change management, things like that. So there's a lot to build there. Uh, and AWS obviously offers a lot of different things to help you build that. And there's a lot of undifferentiated heavy lifting that we help you uh, work through. You know, in the cloud for data services, analytics, we've got SiteWise and IoT events and, and AWS IoT analytics to help you analyze and take action on the data that you find. We've got IoT Things Graph to help you automate the process of building flows at the edge. We've got device management and device defender as, long, as, well, as well as IoT Core that help you manage those devices at the edge. But what we're gonna be talking specifically about today are the things that we produce that you run at the edge. So that's AWS IoT Greengrass and Amazon Free RTOS. So keeping that stuff secure. So we have to talk about the AWS shared security responsibility model. 
And what does that mean? So it basically means that AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud. We protect the infrastructure that runs the services that are in our cloud. The infrastructure is composed of the hardware and software and networking and facilities that run in our cloud facilities. And then the customer responsibility is to make sure that you have security in the cloud. If you've built an application that runs on AWS, it's up to you to make sure that that remains secure while it runs on AWS services. So a good example of this that's pretty simple um, is EC2. So we maintain the hypervisor, the networking, and the hardware that those uh, instances run on, and we ensure that that's secure. But you install a guest operating system, configure the firewall, and build applications that run on EC2, and it's on you to ensure that those things are secure. Now what does that mean when you move to the edge and start talking about IoT? Well, you own the devices when you're talking about IoT and the hardware that's going to run Greengrass and free RTOS are totally in your control and operate on premises in your environments. So that means it expands the things that you're responsible for in terms of security. So customer data, obviously, you wanna make sure that that stuff is secure. If you're storing it on your device, you wanna make sure that it's encrypted and not accessible. Um, application code, you wanna make sure that you're running applications that are well behaved. Your network, OS, and firewall security, you wanna make sure that stuff's all configured correctly. Uh, client and server side encryption, you wanna make sure that's working. If you have devices that have a hardware root of trust, a secure element, you wanna make sure that that stuff's working properly. Uh, component interface security, if you're writing applications with APIs, you wanna make sure that they're secure as well. And then physical security and tamper resistance. Now this is something specific to the edge because your devices will sit out in sometimes in secure physical locations that people could just grab, pick up, and walk away with. So that's an added level of security you need to be aware of. And you might look at that and think to yourself, that's a lot of things that I'm responsible for. Why would I bother building things at the edge? It's a lot simpler to just build it in the cloud where some of these attack vectors are not there. So let's talk about edge computing and why you might use it. So, there are a lot of reasons you might build an application at the edge, but really when we talk about it internally, we talk about it in terms of the three laws. There's the laws of physics, laws of economics, and the laws of the land. So physics is pretty straightforward. The speed of light is what the speed of light is. If you have things that have latency sensitive use cases, if you're working in oil and gas and you're monitoring like a pressure sensor and you need to take an action based on high pressure really quickly, you may not have time to wait for it to go round trip to the cloud and back. You may need to take action immediately and operating at the edge allows you to do that. Economics, so obviously as the number of devices increases, you're gonna be collecting a lot of data from them. And you may not necessarily care about all of that data, but if you're transiting all of that data to the cloud, there is a transmission cost incurred and a storage cost incurred. So the volume of data is probably gonna grow faster than we can reduce prices for transfer costs. So you might wanna do some filtering and processing at the edge to minimize the amount of data that you send up. And then there's the law of the land. So there are a lot of places in the world that have data sovereignty laws. Europe has the GDPR. If you have requirements to keep data on premises, store it locally, and act on it locally, then you might need to operate at the edge just to ensure that you're in compliance with those laws. So a sample deployment, or what a cloud deployment to the edge might look like. So let's say that you've built an application in AWS and it runs in the cloud and you're using SageMaker to have a machine learning model trained and operated. Uh, you're using Secrets Manager to manage the keys that you're using to authenticate to third party services and you've got some Lambda functions out there uh, that are actually doing some processing. Well, in the edge scenario, what we're actually looking at is pushing some of those primitives from the AWS services down to a gateway device. And that gateway device is probably running green grass, or we hope it's running green grass. Um, so you're allowed to push Lambda functions and SageMaker machine learning models down to the edge so that those gateway devices can execute the code and operate uh, machine learning inference on things that are collected there. Now, you might pass some of that data back and then you'd transit it back to the cloud for storage and whatever service you choose. So that's kind of the general overview of what that might look like. And in terms of the gateway, what you're running at the edge, we'll talk about Greengrass, because this is the software that we've designed to operate at the edge for these particular use cases. So if you're not familiar with Greengrass, I'll talk about it a little bit and kind of give you an overview, and then we'll dive into the security features. So AWS IoT Greengrass is really two pieces. It's a cloud-based service that allows you to bundle together AWS primitives like Lambda functions and machine learning models into a deployable package. And then we have the other side, which runs at the edge, which we call the Greengrass core software. And that runs on x86 or ARM, implement, or ARM hardware. 
And what it acts as is as a deployment target for the cloud service. So you can bundle up Lambda functions and whatever else in the cloud, deploy it directly to the edge, and the Greengrass will execute those things on your hardware at the edge. So it offers a lot of feature functionality. Um, we've got a local message uh, server, so MQTT runs on the Greengrass core for processing messages from local devices. Uh, we can operate local actions at the edge using Lambda, so you can push Lambda functions to a Greengrass core. Uh, data and state sync, um, if you have uh, IoT devices with shadow, you can sync the shadow locally and then sync it to IoT core later. Um, security, so we're obviously gonna go more into detail about this in a minute. I won't belabor the point here, but we do have some security features. Um, local resource access, so you can get access to the file system, attached devices, other things that are on the actual device Greengrass is running on. Uh, machine learning inference, like I mentioned, you can push machine learning models down to the Greengrass device. Uh, connectors. Um, so we offer a library of pre-built uh, integrations to AWS and third-party services. Um, some of the ones you might care about, we have uh, pre-built connectors for analytics and a pre-built connector for IoT device defender, so you can do operations and anomaly detection using those two services without having to write code. Um, we have over-the-air updates. So one of the risks that you can get into with some of these IoT devices, they could sit out there for weeks or months, sometimes even years, without seeing a software update. Um, every deployment of AWS IoT Greengrass comes with an OTA agent, so at any time from the device, you can actually trigger an update to the latest version of Greengrass so that you stay current. Um, and then the final thing is the secure credential store. Um, if you are using AWS Secrets Manager in the cloud, uh, you are able to push secrets down from that into the device where it's stored safely on the device so that you can use it in Lambda functions and connectors. So, let's get a little more deep into the security aspects. So, like I said, uh, there is a cloud side and there is a device side at the edge. So, when you deploy from Greengrass the cloud to Greengrass at the edge, um, you create what's called a Greengrass group. And that group can contain the Greengrass core, which is the device that's actually running the software, and Greengrass devices. And those could be cameras, temperature sensors, anything that you want to connect and collect data from to the Greengrass core. Uh, when you deploy, it creates these at the edge. Now, how do you secure the way that Greengrass interacts with the cloud and the data that it stores locally? And we do that in a bunch of different ways. Uh, the most important way is that we have TLS mutual authentication between every single piece of this diagram. TLS mutual auth between Greengrass cores and the cloud, between Greengrass devices and the cores, and between green, Greengrass devices and the IoT Greengrass service if you choose to connect it. So from an authentication perspective, there are really five major pieces. Uh, so A is the Greengrass service role. It's a cloud-side IAM role that allows uh, IoT Greengrass to perform actions on your behalf on the cloud side, so the Greengrass service. This entitles it to Lambda and a few other services so that it can do the cloud-side operations it needs to. Um, box B, that's the core device certificate. So it's an X509 certificate that we use to authenticate to IoT core. Uh, and then box C is the device certificate, and it is the certificate that resides on the Greengrass device that allows it to perform mutual authentication with the Greengrass core to pass messages back. And then uh, we've got box D, which is the group role. Now this is an IAM policy that is specific to the Greengrass core itself, and you can use an IAM policy to control what services it has access to in the cloud. So Greengrass can actually call into any AWS API and perform actions in any of those services, but the IAM policy will allow you to lock that down so that it can only call into the ones you specifically want it to use. And then E is the root CA, um, so that's used by the MQTT server on the actual Greengrass core that allows it to perform that mutual authentication with the devices that are out there on the edge. So that's kind of an overview how that works. Now on the cloud side, all of these different pieces that interact with each other are all controlled by that Greengrass service role policy. So Greengrass can't perform an action on the behalf of the application without you specifically entitling it to. Now, if you're using other applications that aren't inside the AWS cloud, you can't use IAM to restrict access to those. You might use something like Splunk or Twilio and want to perform calls out from your Greengrass cores to those services. And that's what we have the AWS IoT Greengrass Secrets Manager for. And really what that is, is it allows you to store encrypted credentials for anything, uh, an AWS service or a non-AWS service, on the Greengrass core device so that your Lambda functions and connectors can use it. So, 
how does that actually work? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you go into Secrets Manager, provision your secret there, and then go back to Greengrass. And when you go back to your group configuration prior to deployment, you can actually see all of the secrets you've created in Secrets Manager, you'll attach it to the group, and you'll deploy it. Now, it's encrypted in transit and at rest, so no one can ever see it. We don't store it in plain text on the device anywhere, um, and it's available for use by anything that you've written that runs on the device. So, we've done a little overview of just generally how the Greengrass security model works. Um, and we've covered, you know, identity with IAM roles, the authentication with X509 certificates, you can have RSA or elliptic curve certificates, uh, the encryption with the TLS protocol, the public and private key pair for encryption, uh, the security framework that we have present by default. But what we also hear is that there are customers that do put things in unsecured real-world locations, like I mentioned earlier. We've got things like vehicle tracking devices, temperature sensors, and video cameras, right? And those devices may sit out in the world where they're exposed to people all the time. <clears throat> How do we actually ensure that if someone gets a hand on your Greengrass core device, they're not able to access all the secrets within? Well, that's why we added support for hardware secure elements that support the PKCS11 standard. So, if you are using the certificates, you'll be using the certificates, and if you use AWS Secrets Manager, anything that you store on the device is stored in the hardware secure element by default. So if someone gets uh, access to your device physically, they can't get access to your keys or passwords or credentials. There are a lot of partners that support this, so there's a list here on this slide. Um, Intel and Logic Supply, Microchip, Infineon, NXP, and a bunch of others. Um, everything is available in the hardware qualification portal that AWS supports, so if you want to know what devices actually have hardware secure element support, you can find out there. Um, and that's kind of a deep dive into the security framework itself, but what does that look like in the real world? Like, what applications have people actually built on top of it? Um, so I, I'm assuming that the overlap between attendees of reInvent and attendees of this conference are pretty heavy. Um, so if you went to reInvent this year, you probably had the reInvent app on your phone. And in that app, there was a new feature that actually showed you the wait time for a shuttle between any of the various venues um, at reInvent. And what that actually was is that was an application running on Greengrass uh, that sat in the field at each of these different uh, locations. Uh, it was a logic supply board uh, with uh, connected to cameras that were watching the folks that were getting onto the bus. And it was estimating the time based on the number of people in line that it would take you to get from one venue to another. All of that processing happened at the edge. It did all the processing and estimation and uh, ML inference and then passed the result back up into the cloud to IoT Core and API Gateway. And API Gateway then served that data back down to your phone. So without knowing it, you're actually using one of our edge applications in the field. Now, it's not just used internally. There are a bunch of other folks that have used our, uh, our solution as well. Uh, Thermo Fisher and Tensor IoT use IoT Greengrass and IoT Device Defender together uh, for security purposes. So they actually built a connected lab solution to help the researchers with their sharing and collaboration and remote monitoring of their equipment um, and asset management. Um, they had uh, a pilot that they built using it, and it used this is what the architecture looked like. Uh, use Greengrass and uh, machine learning at the edge, along with the Alexa voice service, to collect data via LoRa and Wi-Fi, uh, and then pass that data back up into the AWS cloud. Now, they used Device Defender for anomaly detection and SageMaker to retrain their models with the data that they collected, um, and then pass that data back into their systems. Um, but really, that's a good real-world example of what that looked like. So that's kind of a dive into Greengrass. Um, that's it for me, so I'll invite Neil up here onto the stage so he can talk a little bit more about FreeRTOS and then show you guys the demo. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. Are you guys still able to hear me? Show me a thumbs up. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Neil Mitra. Um, and I'm going to take you all through the rest of the presentation. So, so far, you heard about Greengrass. So, essentially, if you have a device and you install Greengrass on it, it can act as a connected device on its own, a very powerful device with all the capabilities that Scott mentioned, local computing, machine learning inferencing, local broker, and other stuff. Or it can work as a gateway. That means it can act as a front door to lots of back-end devices, which could be either IP-based devices or non-IP-based devices. Maybe they're talking over Bluetooth or LoRa or Sigfox, you name it. But then, 
when we talk to our customers, we also realize there is a completely separate category of age services as well that we internally refer to as age of age. And these devices are very small in size, they're very resource constrained, but they're still on the field and doing lots of cool stuff. If you have to guess, well, this is not a perfect uh, stage for gu guessing, but if you had to guess, um, it is called microcontrollers. And microcontrollers are everywhere. This had been very popular in the industrial space. So if you think of pressure sensors or any kind of sensors and actuators, they're essentially using microcontrollers. If you think of automotive and robotics, they're all using microcontrollers. And microcontrollers are now popular across other in segments as well. For example, if you think about commercial, all the smart energy meters that we see, all the smart locks we are seeing, all the security cameras, the connected HVAC systems, they're essentially using microcontrollers. If we think about the consumer space, we have our smart watches, we have the fitness trackers, we have the asset trackers, we have the light bulbs, which we can just switch on, switch off, dim the lights, all of these are microcontrollers. And there's a projection that there will be around 20 billion microcontroller-based devices in the next few years to come. So if you think about these microcontrollers, and let me just probably take one example, a light bulb. So what are we able to do with a light bulb now? Not just switch on and off. We are able to dim it to different percentage. We can change colors and probably we'll be able to do a lot cooler stuff in the future to come. So if you're a developer, how many of you are developers here? Show me your hands. Okay. So if you are a developer and you have to fit all your code into a light bulb, you can imagine that might not be easy with a st standard operating system like Linux or Windows. We need a different category of operating system to handle this kind of use cases. And that's what is referred to as real-time operating systems just based for microcontroller devices, but it still has all the different capabilities starting from a bootloader, which you need to boot the device. You probably need to manage keys, and of course you need to connect to them securely, so that's where you need key management. There needs to be a communication stack. How do you communicate to the device? Over BLE, over Wi-Fi, over some other protocol like Zigbee? What do you do? So there has to be communication stack. And different functionalities like dimming the lights, switching on, switching off, etc. So if you have to put this into a different operating system that I mentioned is referred to as free uh, RTOS, there had been different version in the industry. Free RTOS is a market-leading uh, real-time operating system that has been there since 2003. Anyone here heard about Free RTOS? Okay, a lot of you have heard of it. Great. So Free RTOS founder Richard Berry. Uh, who was like the Linux Torvalds of the Linux world. Um, he joined Amazon a few years back and he's uh, working to take FreeRTOS to the next level with a lot of capabilities and features and integrations to make it more cloud native. So what we have done so far with FreeRTOS, we have still kept it open source. So if you want to leverage FreeRTOS in the most vanilla form in its own kernel, add your own libraries, your own customizations, absolutely, you can still do it. But then our customers like you told us that, can we make life easier for you? Can we do the undifferentiated heavy lifting just like we do in the cloud? Can we make it easier for you build devices rather than focusing on figuring out the underlying hardware, different libraries, different configurations, how we do that? So that's why we had been building different libraries on top of the free RTOS kernel so that you can use it just out of the box and focus on the business value, which is writing your own application and not worrying about the underlying APIs and libraries related to the hardwares. So the local connectivity libraries, you just heard about green grass. So if you had to run your connected devices like your light bulbs or thermostats behind a gateway, you need libraries to connect to the gateway. That's what is referred to as local connectivity libraries. And today we support local connectivity libraries with green grass that you just learned about. Then cloud connectivity libraries. There could be use cases where the device can just talk to the cloud directly. That does not need to go to, through a gateway. So they might have Wi-Fi modules and Wi-Fi libraries help them to connect directly to the cloud and they exchange the data. 
um, and you do your respective analytics on top of that. And then the security connectivity libraries, which we'll dive into. It's a security conference, so we have separate slides just focused on security to dive deeper. And then once you have the devices deployed, you want to ensure that you are able to update those devices from time to time over the air in an easy way, just like you update your smartphones and uh, smart tablets and whatever. So with that background, let's dive a little deeper into the architecture. So at the underlying uh, stack is your hardware and the vendor supplied library. So you can use different boards, and we'll talk more about it, but we are partnered with um, market-leading manufacturers, if you think of Microchip, if you think of Atmel, Texas Instruments, um, Espressif, we are partnered with all of those guys, and they are building hardwares which can run using Amazon FreeRTOS. So you see the vendor supplied libraries, they're essentially creating this abstracted set of libraries that can work with Amazon FreeRTOS. And from our side, we are also building the set of internal libraries, which helps us to roll out this operating system across different hardwares and manufacturers and devices. So you don't have to do that heavy lifting of testing your code into all hardware and getting into all kind of issues with your code and libraries. We're trying to make that easy for you. On the left, you will see the FreeRTOS kernel. This is essentially the open source FreeRTOS kernel that Richard Barry started developing since 2003. So this is the FreeRTOS kernel that is still being used. And on top of it, we are adding all these different libraries that you can see, MQTT agent. So it's a pretty low power, resource constrained devices. Uh, it needs to communicate over a protocol which is lightweight as well. So that's why MQTT. Um, it supports Wi-Fi and BLE, which are open standards as well. And then we have added certain libraries from the AWS ecosystem, like uh, for Greengrass or Device Shadow, or how do you update it over the air. We have put some agents as well. Now, one thing if you have noticed that all these different standards we're talking about here are open standards. So there is no ecosystem lock-in, there is no platform lock-in. You are still able to take advantage of all these different libraries which are available for you. If you don't want to use any libraries, you also have the option to choose the ones that you like. So once you, when you go and download FreeRTOS from the AWS console, it gives you different options, what kind of modules and libraries you want. So it gives you the balance of how custom you want to go versus how much out of the box capability that you want to use that we are giving you to make your life easier. Make sense? Uh, and top of that, is your user application code. So this is where the light bulb example comes again. So you want to switch on, switch off, do the dimming, that's your application code. So now you can just focus on writing your application code and let AWS and our partners handle the under undifferentiated heavy lifting of managing all the libraries and intricacies and dependencies. So now let's talk a little more about security. So when we think about security, there are essentially three different pillars. Right? One is how do I authenticate securely? How do I authorize uh, the devices to do what it is entitled to do? And then finally, how do I ensure that all my data is encrypted? So authentication, we support TLS version 1.2. So which helps you with the mutual authentication. It is a key-based so key based authentication. So that means you have your private keys and the public keys. The key-based authentication happens and you are entitled to talk to the AWS IoT cloud endpoint. In terms of authorization, this uses the policies that is used for all other AWS services. So you put the permissions in a JSON file saying, you know what, my device can only connect and publish versus my device can only connect and subscribe. It's a best practice not to give an over-permissive policy to any device. And that's across the board, not just IoT. So if you had been using AWS, you will know that policies plays a key role and the same principles applies here as well. In terms of encryption, so how do you encrypt the data at rest and how do you encrypt the data in transit? So TLS v1.2 is used for keeping your data encrypted in transit as you communicate from your device to the cloud. And for data at rest, we offer PKCS integration, public key cryptography standards, version 11. So what you will do, you will essentially encrypt your private key. So if there is a hack to your device, maybe you know it's a hack 
to do a denial of service or it could be a sabotage or it could be a randomware, whatever it is. You need to ensure that your private key is never compromised. And how do you do that? You do that using PKCS 11. And I have a demo coming up where you will see how that works in action. Okay, and in a microcontroller, there is no open network ports, essentially. You, uh, if you have used microcontrollers, you, uh, you will know like you have to flash the image and you have to deploy the image. And then once you deploy, in the future, you can take advantage of OTA to communicate off over it in a just specific port, which is not open. Um, so that brings us to over-the-air update, which was pretty crucial for many of our customers. They mentioned that, okay, I have all these devices, how do I ensure that they are properly grouped and they are patched from time to time and they're secure? So what you can do, you can take advantage of IoT device management, which is a separate service that we have, and once your device, whether it's a microcontroller based, whether it's a IoT device SDK based, or whether it's a green grass based, it's always a thing in our device registry. So you can group all your devices. You can group by manufacturer, you can group by geographic location, you can group by whatever makes sense for your use case. We give you the enabler, we give you the tool, you implement based on your use case. And once you have created a group of devices, you can essentially say that, okay, this is my group of devices that I need to patch, and you send the instruction, and that's pretty much it. So we are also making your life easier from the cloud side of it, with all these different services that we refer to as control services that you can take advantage of to manage and patch your devices. Um, in terms of microcontroller, we also su uh, support code signing. That means you need to ensure that the microcontrollers are only running trusted code. So you can sign your code using different cryptographic signatures and then push that code over the air to the microcontrollers. And also on the device itself, you will validate the signature is correct before you install the code. So even if you are a hacker, or even if a hacker tries to hack into your device, and if it is pushing some code, if that code does not have the valid signature, it won't have if you are protecting your keys, then it, that code won't be installed on your device. So that way you ensure that your devices are always protected. Make sense so far? Okay. We also launched uh, Bluetooth support, BLE 4.2 and above, um, just some time back. So many of our customers, again, told us that, you might know like 90% um, 90, 90 of our product roadmap comes, on, comes from your feedback, and 10% based on different market research and our internal experience, right? So our customers had been using microcontrollers in all these different kind of devices, starting from fitness trackers and the industrial space. Um, and they told us often they need the technician to go and install the devices as well. It's always not self-installed. And the technician need to connect to the device to some kind of mobile application because it can connect over BLE for the initial pairing. And then the device can be configured to talk to the cloud, and from there it's easy. You can just push the latest update and stuff. Just like if you think of if you bought a new um, AirPod or something, right? You bring it closer to your iPhone, and they do the initial pairing, and from then onwards, the AirPod can work on its own, or same thing with the Apple Watch. So it's a similar concept. It could be expanded to different other devices, which can talk over BLE to a local device, which is nearby, and then from there, it can talk to the cloud, do the initial exchange, and from there, it can continue to talk through that proxy, or it can directly talk to the cloud as well. So if you have any of those use cases, that's where this workflow helps. Um, and once it is connected to the proxy, it takes advantage of MQTT and HTTP and WebSockets, all these different protocols that we support out of the box. That is equally applicable for microcontroller-based devices as well. One other thing to notice here is Cognito. Anyone here use Cognito? Okay. So. There are two different ways, right? as I was explaining, for the authentication. One could be a key-based. That means you have your um, asymmetric keys, you have the private key, you have the public key, the key exchange happens. If the keys are valid, mutual authentication works, and you are able to connect to the cloud endpoint. The other option is many customers tell us that you know, we don't want to do a key-based authentication. We want something else. We probably have our custom um, you know, authorization solutions, like it's based on JWT. Uh, we are probably using something like a SAML. How do we do it? 
So Cognito is a AWS managed solution which is used by web applications and mobiles for token based authorization. So now your device can talk to the mobile and the mobile either running iOS SDK or Android SDK, both are supported, can take advantage of Cognito with JSON web token or other token based um, you know, methodologies to connect to the cloud as well. Uh, another important thing uh, with Bluetooth is, since we are supporting 4.2 and above, so we support the latest security capabilities that Bluetooth brings, which includes the generic access profile and the generic attributes, which essentially ensures that your communication between the microcontrollers and the device are also secured. Not anyone should be able to come and connect to these devices. So you need to have a proper pairing and bonding mechanism. It could be a numeric based, it could be a key, um, you know, pass phrase based. It could be different methodologies that is already supported by the BLE specifications as well. And these are all the different partners today, and it's uh, always growing, who already have development and production ready boards that can run microcontrollers. Uh, so if you want to take advantage of you know, microcontrollers, you have an application in mind, you can use the boards from any of these guys. Uh, they have been a part of our partner catalog, they have qualified, and you can use um, to get started quickly. Now one customer, um, Pentair, they had been uh, changing, transforming different industries for a long, long time. So if you think about residential or commercial, industrial, agricultural, they had been working across all these different segments. And some of their notable contributions include saving millions of gallons of water, uh, saving billions of dollars in energy, and you can see the others as well. And the way they did it, they used microcontrollers and they use different connecting devices methodologies to ensure they're continuously getting the data, ingesting the data, analyzing the data, doing machine learning, inferencing on the data to add this value. Some of the problem statements were, you know, they were looking to do this in a more secure way and they had to build a lot of uh, capabilities themselves that they didn't want it to. They wanted to focus on the business logic rather than you know, figuring out which boards can work, what are the uh, you know, different libraries that need to work on, and also that you know, makes their time to market slower. So they wanted to develop faster so that you know, they can do more stuff. And what they did, they essentially used a board from Espressif, and you can see the name ESP32W Room, um, and they installed Amazon Free RTOS, and they are slowly rolling out this capability to different other devices as well. One last thing, if you feel that, you know, I want to be a partner, like I have a board that I want to build um, with my custom specifications, but I want it to be qualified. You can take advantage of device tester that's available both for free RTOS or green grass. So we give you uh, different you know, tools to essentially test your device if it is compatible with the respective software and the libraries, and then you can use that for your use case as well, and you can bring it to your partner catalog as well. So with that, um, let's get into a demo. So you saw this architecture before when Scott was here. He was explaining how you can have different kind of devices locally and uh, they can uh, connect to green grass and from green grass you use the green grass capabilities uh, like HSM to connect to the cloud securely. And what I'm going to show you during the demo is both this side. I have a um, Raspberry Pi here, which is running green grass and using PKCS. So after the session, if you want to see more, you can come, it's actually here. Um, I can show you how it works. <laughs> Just take a minute. Okay, um, so you can see how it works here, but uh, due to logistical issues, we have actually pre-recorded the demo and I will uh, explain what is actually happening. So let me quickly switch to the demo. Okay. 
So on the right, you see the AWS console where a Greengrass group is already created. In the interest of time, we did it before. And in the Greengrass group, you see all these different uh, capabilities on the side. You can create different routing rules, like how your devices should communicate with the cloud uh, through Greengrass. Uh, Greengrass code, which is essentially brain behind Greengrass, this is a process that runs on Raspberry Pi or any Greengrass enabled devices that you are running. This is a local device that I created called Smart Home. It could be similar to a light or thermostat or whatever, but it's a mock device. And then on the left, you see the Raspberry Pi console where I have the Greengrass installed. So if you see, there are different folders like for over the air, certificates, configurations. And if we see the configuration file, um, that's where you will see the different endpoints. So it is connecting to the IoT US East endpoint. You can see the Greengrass endpoint. Also at the bottom, you will see the private key and the public certificates. Everything is in the file system that Greengrass is using at this point. Um, and uh, Greengrass is running. Um, because I have started it before as well. And this is essentially the Greengrass core process as um, you are seeing on the console. Now what is going to happen is this device, Smart Home, is talking to Greengrass and you saw in the routing rules, I have already added that subscription. And what we will do, and, the, and, the, and it has its different certificates. So the Smart Home device, which is connected to the gateway, it has different set of certificates than the Greengrass, which has its own certificate because that is the process running as a gateway. Make sense? And now we are starting an application on my Raspberry Pi, and it is communicating through Greengrass to the cloud. So you will shortly see that there are messages that is coming from the smart meters with voltage, timestamp, and all those kind of stuff. So in the real world, you will have a device running a gateway, uh, which will talk to different other local devices, and it will capture you know, the sensors and actuators. And this is uh, essentially, Greengrass is a thing as well in the device registry, just like I was explaining before. And it has a certificate associated with it for mutual authentication. And the certificate you can see on the left is same as a certificate that is on the core. So it's essentially the same Greengrass core that is running here um, and as associated on, uh, on the cloud. The second part is now we don't want to keep the certificate, uh, we can keep the certificates local, but the private keys has to be secured. The private key should not be there in the file system in open text, because if there is a hack, then the private key gets compromised. So we are taking advantage of PKCS 11 integration that Greengrass supports now, and I'm using a microchip, a secure element to do that, and I can show you after the session if you're interested. It is connected over an I2C port, and you can see this is the name of the device, and the device zone is currently locked, both the config zone and the data zone. So once you have generated the certificate, um, that zone is locked, so no one can even compromise the data that is stored in the zone. And it can also store the secrets. So now what I have done, I just created the certificate signing request, which will essentially give me a certificate from the cloud, which will be used next time. And we are just verifying the certificate is fine. So in simple terms, I have the private key, which is generating the certificates. If anyone here is familiar with you know, certificate management, you will know that you don't want to send private key over the air because that can also compromise your private key. So you are essentially creating a CSR or certificate signing request that you are sending to the cloud and getting a certificate from the, there. So now I am uploading the CSR that I just created I'm downloading the certificates. That is the only public certificate that can be exposed. And even if the public certificate gets compromised, you are good because your private key is still safe. It's not in the memory, it's not in the file system. And on the core now, uh, we had the old certificate that I showed you here on Pi. Now we have the new certificate created as well. So we'll associate the new certificate. You see it is active now. It has a po policy which essentially helps the device to authorize. And we are attaching the certificate to the Greengrass core. <laughs> now if going back to the Greengrass core, you see now there are two certificates. And what we'll do, we will shut down the Greengrass daemon running on Linux so that we have a clean start with the new certificate. So we're stopping the Greengrass demon, which will take a few seconds. Oh. 
Okay, so it stopped. We are checking that it's cleaned up and now we will detach the old certificates that we had on the Raspberry Pi, okay? This is a little going into the weeds, but we wanted to show you like how it really works in the real world. So now I copied the new certificate that I got from the IoT CA and I copied into the Raspberry Pi. And this also needs to be copied into the Greengrass installation folder. So the Greengrass search folder, it needs to be copied. And then the configuration file that we have so you will see that the new certificate is copied under, under the Greengrass certification, uh, Greengrass certificate folder, and the old certificate that we had with 2FC, we will move that to a different area, just to ensure that they're not using the old certificates. So we move that to TMP, and now we just have one certificate that Greengrass can use on that device, okay? Next, what we are going to do is we'll also need to change the config file because the Greengrass configuration file is still using the old private key and the public key path. So if you see there, it still has the old private key and the public key. We are creating the new config with PKCS, which just has the new libraries for PKCS and it, it does not have a private key path because it's in the secure element itself. It only have the certificate that we just created from the console. And now what we'll do, we'll start the Greengrass daemon again with the new certificate and the new configuration that we just created. So we see it is running, that Greengrass daemon with the PID 9246. And we'll go back to the script that we initially ran with the old certificate and the private keys. And, we, and the Greengrass will start streaming data as well with PKCS integration. So you see that data has started coming now, and it is now using the PKCS integration, which is a secure element. That means, again, your private key is not there in the file system or in the memory of your device. It's in the secure element that is being used by Greengrass SDK to communicate to the cloud endpoint. So that's how you are secure. Make sense? Okay, switching back to the PowerPoint. So that's what we did. Um, we used a device certificate that is a smart home certificate. And then the hardware secure element, again, is the middle, which is now storing your private key. And then the MQTT server certificate is a CA um, root certificate that is used to sign uh, all the messages to ensure that it is coming from a correct endpoint. And then the local device, which was smart home here, it was sending the data to Greengrass Core, the bottom flow, and then Greengrass Core was sending the data to IoT Core, which is the top flow that you saw on the right side of the console. So that's how this whole flow works in the real world with real hardware and real chips. Okay, again, if you're interested to learn more about uh, this setup and workflow, I have it right here. So you can come and I can show this to you after the session. Um, we also have another session today uh, at 3.30, so if you want to get hands-on with Greengrass, um, feel free to come over. Uh, it's pretty open. I don't know. I don't think you have to register. So if you want to get your hands dirty and build a real Greengrass core um, and play with it, feel free to come and join us. And that's pretty much it. So, you know, thank you for your time. Thanks for spending one hour of your life with us today. <laughs> really appreciate it. If you have any questions, Scott and I are here. And if you want to see the demo, feel free to come over here. And please do not forget to share your feedback um, because we really appreciate your feedback and we can work on the bad and good things both. Okay, that being said, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.